see you guys this morning. It actually feels like fall, doesn't it? It's, uh, at least if you're here. Um, our online campus, man, I want to welcome them in. We've got people from all over the country right now logged in. We've got our Oklahoma house campus logged in amongst various other people all around the country. Do me a favor. Why don't you welcome them in today if you would? We're so glad you guys are with us as well. Well, as you know, if you've been with us, if not, if it's your first time with us, when we gather each and every week, we stand and we read a theme verse for our series together. So do me a favor, everybody on your, I know you just sat down, but everybody back up. If you're in your living room at home, on your feet, wherever you are worshiping with us with, and we're going to read uh, from Joshua chapter 18, verse three, let's read this together. How long will you wait to take possession of the land? Let's pray. Father, today. God, as we get ready to open your word, as we get ready to talk about uh, the promises that you give us along uh, with the push that you give us, God, I pray that today as we talk about what does it look like to take the land for the kingdom? What does it look like to take the land for the gospel? God, as we talk about today not settling for less, God, I pray that we would realize today that we have a God that is bigger than circumstance, that we have a God that is doing miracles that sometimes we don't even see in our own lives. God, I pray that, that today maybe we walked in here ready to settle on one side of life, and God, you're going to push us to the other. God, I pray today that we would be different because we have gathered, whether in this space or in a living room or in a house or in a hotel or, or on vacation or wherever um, people are a part of service today. God, I pray uh, that in these moments, we would be different than when we entered. God, may your word speak life into us today. May it be about the message, not the messenger. Um, God, may you be the messenger today, um, not man. God, we love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. Uh, before we do dive in, I just, I want to let you know, just a little update on something. Um, a lot of you have asked questions, hey, the hurricane in North Carolina, are we doing anything for that? Um, here is the medium length answer to that, okay? Um, the short is we are, we are, yes, we are going to. Um, the medium length is uh, actually New Bern, North Carolina that you guys probably saw on the news. Um, my cousin lives in New Bern. They're a part of a church in New Bern. Um, I actually spoke at that church this last summer uh, for them, and I, I actually was in contact with them, and they just said, hey, let us get our bearings about us before we do anything. We need to know what the needs actually are, not just the, like the immediate need, but we're just trying to decipher. Um, and so we've been talking with them this week, and they're sending us information on how we can best help, whether that's sending people down there or that is financial resources. Um, just be looking for some of that stuff either on our online presence, or we'll be talking about that um, in the next week or so as we can continue to help. Because we know a lot of times, a lot of help on the front end is great. Um, then all the workers go home and there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and so we want to make sure we're the most effective for the communities that have been affected by that. So just wanted to give you guys that this morning as well. So we're in week three of this series, Take the Land. And last week, we, we talked about um, Joshua sending the spies, right? Um, and these spies came back and they gave this report. They're like, listen, we, we can take the land, Joshua. Joshua already kind of knew this. And they had this unlikely partner, this unlikely neighbor that have helped them. Her name was Rahab and she was a prostitute. Now, if you're new to church, you're like, wait, what did you just say? Um, go back and watch last week's message. Um, yes, uh, an unlikely person, Rahab the prostitute, helped out the, the nation of Israel. She helped out these spies. And we asked this question last week, and the question was, why do we not have an urgency for seeing our neighbors know Jesus? That was the question we asked. And as we dove into that, what we talked about often it's because of fear that we don't engage our neighbors that way. So some of the tribes of Israel today, as we jump in, like they wanted to play it safe regarding their neighbors. That they didn't, they didn't really want to risk an uncertain future. They, 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 so they chose to kind of see what was before them instead of what was ahead of them. They chose to settle. Have you ever settled for something less than waiting for the better thing? Have you ever done that? I don't know if you've ever settled for something less. You're like, man, I, I really want this, or I really feel like, man, I should wait for this, but you just can't wait. So you're like, but I'm going to go ahead and settle for this. I mean, this is good. There's nothing wrong with this, but... But this, oh, if you just waited. It's kind of like, it's kind of like when you buy something and you're like, oh, well, I want it now. So I'm just going to buy it now. And then like six weeks later, the new thing comes out. You're like, ah, oh, if I had just waited, I could have had this. But I settled for that. And there's this interesting dynamic. Think about just history for a moment. Like there's two types of people in history. There are people that are pioneers, right? 
They go, into, they go into uncharted lands. They go into uncharted places. They're pioneers in those. Like, like our entire country was pioneered. You realize that, right? Pioneers came across this country, and then they did what as they made their way across? They settled. They settled in these places. Now, if you've ever played the game Oregon Trail before, you know you don't want to go too far west because you might get dysentery and die, Right? They were living Oregon Trail. They weren't playing Oregon Trail. They were living it. But there were those that were like, but we think there's something greater out there. So we're just going to keep pushing ourselves west. And those that settled maybe never saw something even greater. Like if you settled in Springfield, Illinois, and you never got to Colorado, you thought Springfield, Illinois was the most beautiful place on the planet. By the way, I've lived in Springfield, Illinois. That is not the truth. It is flat and full of corn. That's it. You go to Colorado, man, and you're like, whoa. Well, if all you ever knew was the Midwest, all you ever knew was corn on I-55 in Illinois. Anybody live on I-55 in Illinois? Uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. The three of us in this room that have been there, we know. But you go to Colorado, you've never seen a mountain, and you go and you're like, Wow. Or you go, you get to the West Coast and then you see the ocean for the first time in the expanse. I, I joked with the worship team. I was like, I love that song, Oceans, they did. I'm like, but it's just like the ocean. It goes on forever. It's amazing. Um, I, that's a joke, by the way. It's a good song. Um, uh, but I just think about, man, the first time you get to the edge of the ocean, like there's this, somebody pioneered getting there. And if you just settled back here for something good, you might have missed out on what was great. And I think we do that all the time. Maybe for you, it was a financial decision. It was a, a choice maybe of where to live. And you're like, man, we'll, we'll just, we'll go here because we want to just get settled. Maybe, maybe for you, it's a step in your spiritual journey. Maybe it was a romantic relationship. In some way, you settled for something less than you're capable of. You decided it wasn't worth the fight or the perseverance to, to do it right. So you just settled. Like, let's take that romantic relationship for an example. Perhaps due to maybe some things in your past, maybe dealing with some low self-esteem, you, you thought you didn't deserve someone better than, than you chose to be with, so you settled for something unhealthy. Somebody that was going to abuse you verbally, emotionally. Maybe you just became comfortable. You didn't realize the negative effects until, honestly, in your mind, it was too late. And you settled because you're afraid of failure. You're afraid of what people would think. You're afraid that people would start to say, well, uh, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you alone? And so you settled for less instead of maybe what God would have had in store for you. Or, or maybe you chose to settle the consequences and play it out like this. Like uh, maybe in your life, it wasn't a relationship and maybe common sense and judgment flew out the window when you're trying to make particular decisions in your life. And you just begin to settle. People settle not just in relationships, you settle in your work life, in your parenting, spiritual growth. Sometimes we, we make every effort to, to settle so hard that we just stop trying. It's almost more exhausting than pushing through. We get comfortable in our job and we might get laid off, right? We, we get comfortable in our marriage and you begin to neglect it and all of a sudden you can't figure out why it's imploded or, or we get comfortable in our spiritual walk and Satan has a heyday with us when we get comfortable in our spiritual walk. But we don't move forward when we're like, you know what, I'm good right here, God. I don't need any more of you than what you've already given me. That's when we start to get in trouble because scripture says Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion waiting to devour, waiting to pounce. Like, I don't know if you relate to any of these situations. My guess is you do. And, and God's word has some practical help to offer. So we're, we're going to look at several tribes of the nation of Israel who settled for less than God's best. And what they settled for, don't miss this. What they settled, it was good. It just wasn't the best. So if you remember last week, Joshua sends these two spies. They check out Jericho. They come back with a favorable report with God's help, Right. Joshua already knows, hey, we should be taking this land. He was a spy once that came back and we're like, hey, we can do this. Now he sends the spies just to make sure his due diligence is there. Um, and they knew that God was going to allow them to overtake these pagan people in the land of Canaan. Give them the land west of the Jordan River. He's like, we're going to do this. But if we go back in time, we'll see what transpired uh, before that. Go over to Numbers 32. If you've got Bibles, we're going to hang there for just a moment. Um, but there's several tribes of Israel. You've got Reuben, you've got Gad, and then you've got this half tribe uh, of Manasseh. They'd already staked out their claim, um, and they chose to settle east of the Jordan River. Like, they've chose to settle. Don't miss that. 
They've already said, hey, we're not going any further. Listen to Numbers 32, uh, verse 1 through 5. It says, so the Reubenites and the Gadites, who had very large herds and flocks, saw the lands of Jazar and Gilead were suitable for livestock. So they came to Moses and Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the community and said, Eratoth, Dibon, Jazar, Nimrah, Heshbon, Eliah, Sabom, Nobah, and Baon. By the way, if you think your name's weird, there you go, Okay. It says, the land the Lord subdued before the people of Israel are suitable for livestock and your servants have livestock. They're like, hey, we've got cows. This is a great place for cows. And then, then they say, if we have found favor in your eyes, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Do not make us cross the Jordan. Like, do you hear them settling already? Like, don't, don't make us cross the Jordan. These trolls, they saw the land that they were already in. They're like, man, we've got cows, man. Our cows could eat for years, for decades, for, for centuries here. Like, we're just going to chill here. Moses, this journey has been hard. I'm tired of wandering. We're tired of trying to get there. And, and as they look, they're enamored with the look of the land. This, it's kind of the middle point uh, east of the Dead Sea, bordering the east bank of the Jordan, uh, all the way up in the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee. And, and at first, Moses is opposed to the idea. At first, he's like, no, you're going with us. We are a nation together. We're going together. He thought they were going to try, try to avoid the battle that was to come because they're getting ready to go into battle, which we're going to talk about a little bit next week. But, but it seemed like these tribes wanted to settle for what was in front of them rather than the uncertain future beyond the Jordan. Like they had pioneered to this point, but they finally got to the place where like, yeah, we're just going to settle here. We don't want to go any further. Then the leaders of the tribes, they suggest they build pens for the livestock and cities for their women and children. Um, but they, then they said this, they said, but we'll arm ourselves for battle. And we'll actually go ahead of you into battle on the other side of the Jordan. So they're not trying to get out of it. I think they were just tired of moving forward. They didn't want to go into the unknown anymore. But they're like, we'll go fight. We just don't want to, we don't want to go any further. And as we read in Joshua 22, these tribes do, in fact, they keep, they keep their promise. They go into battle um, to conquest Cana with their brothers in arms. But after their suggestion that they go ahead with their brothers and fight alongside them on the other side, Moses accepts their, their plea. He lets them settle. And, and because of their promise to fight, it, it seemed God was okay with their plan. But but you have to question whether or not there were people in the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh who wondered, what if, we had, what if we'd not settled here? Like, what, what, if, what if we might, what might we have inherited had we, had we gone on with the rest of Israel? What, what would God have done? What blessing did we miss out on because we decided to settle instead of move forward? Are you with me? It was a good place they settled. Well, was it the right place? Was it the great place? These tribes grabbed what looked good to them at the time and based on the I kind of want it now philosophy, which isn't that funny that that hasn't changed in history. Like, I don't know if they had Burger King back then, but I think they were using their slogan, have it your way. You stay right. God's like, have it your way. Stay right here. And I want you to write something down this morning that I think we've got to wrestle through. And it's just this. They took the good instead of God's best. They took the good instead of God's best. Have you ever done that? Have you ever taken the good instead of God's best? Maybe you made some decent choices in your life, but, but was it God's best for you at the time? Was it his best? God was getting ready to do something incredible to lead his people into his very best plan for the future inheritance. He's like, I'm going I'm to move you forward. Now, if you want to settle over here, just understand, it, you don't get to experience what they're about to experience. So let's dive back into the study of Joshua. Joshua told God's people who would camp next to the Jordan River that in three days, the people would see the Ark of the Covenant being held by the Levites. We'll come back to that. These are the priests that are going to hold this Ark. And, and when they saw that, they were to follow him. So Joshua says to the people in Joshua 3, verse 5, he says, consecrate yourselves. Get yourselves ready for tomorrow the Lord will do what? Amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, take the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all of Israel so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. He's like, I'm lifting you up. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, 
Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. Then he says, this is how you will know the, that the living God is among you, and they will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gigasites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth going to the Jordan ahead of you. Now they chose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carried the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth set foot in the Jordan, its waters did what? They stopped flowing upstream into a heap. Where did they stop flowing? Upstream. Like, as we dive in, understand the Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments that God had given Moses on Mount Sinai. And the, the Levite priests were, were the ones to be the keepers of the Ark of the Covenant. So during the wandering time in the wilderness, the Ark represented the presence and the power of God with God's people. And as they were traveling throughout the wilderness, this did two things. The people had to keep a distance of a half a mile from the Ark of the Covenant. So the two things that happened there, one um, is that uh, they wouldn't get too close and actually die. Because if you touch the Ark of the Covenant, you, you would die. Um, if you think about Indiana Jones, remember Raiders of the Lost Ark? Remember when the dude touches it? He melts. I'm not sure they were melting in the desert. Well, probably in the desert, yes. But not from the Ark, just from the heat. I don't know if you melted when you touched it, but there's accounts of people falling out dead from touching the Ark of the Covenant. Um, but they also put it just half a mile away so everyone could see it at all times. That there was this reminder that, that God is with you. Looking at the Ark would give them the courage to go on, realizing that they had the power of God with them. But let's keep moving in the story. Check out what happened next. Verse 14. So when the people broke camp across the Jordan... The priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. That's a key statement. Yet as soon as the priest who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped doing what? Flowing. Stopped flowing. It, it piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Araba, which is the, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. And the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and they stood on what kind of ground? What's it say? Dry ground. Well, all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. You get the sense that the nation of Israel has a lot of fun with flowing water stopping. Does this sound remnant of something Moses did? Does this sound remnant of God delivering his people on a regular basis? And he does so by the most astronomical ways. It's really interesting. This instance is a little different. In his book, Second Guessing God, pastor and author Brian Jones, he says this. He said, over a million people had waited their entire adult lives for this moment. All that stood between them and their future lives was the Jordan River. At any other time of the year, God's people could have waded across the Jordan, but not during the floods of the harvest season. He says, the river had turned into a raging deluge, and, and we can only imagine how terrifying the Jordan must have looked to mothers holding hands of their tiny children or elderly couples clinging to each other. Those with disabilities, those who were sick or blind, must have wiped the mist off their faces with panic. Even the swift and strong among the Israelites must have wondered why God brought them to this point only to let them die. I mean, just think about it in the human sense for a minute. You're standing at the edge of the floodwaters. I go back to my friends in North Carolina. This is a very real thing for them. Seeing the floodwaters, seeing them rise. God, have you brought us here to only die? It's interesting that God didn't stop the flow of water right in front of them. That's not where the miracle happened. It wasn't where they were standing. The water piled up a great distance away. Biblical scholars estimate the town of Adam was roughly 18 miles upstream. 18. From where they stood, far beyond where they could see. I, I don't know about you, but on a good day, I struggle to see from here to that camera. And 18 miles away, they're, they're not going to see upstream 18 miles. What is happening? So this damming up of the water would leave some 20 miles for the Israelites to cross the Jordan to get to Jericho. Jericho was four miles above the Dead Sea, so there's an extra bit of mileage there, and it was, it was a miracle. Like, would you agree, this is a miracle, like water stops flowing when they step into the water, yet yeah, it, it was a miracle the people didn't witness with their own eyes. They, they didn't see the miracle take place. 
God performed the miracle upstream out of sight. Can I just remind us today that you may think you're in the middle of the deluge, that you're in the middle of the flood, and God may be stopping some water upstream for you. He may be doing something that you can't see. And I think sometimes we miss the miracle because we think the miracle should happen right in front of our eyes. And sometimes God's best miracles happen upstream where we can't see them, where we don't know they're going to happen. When God is working on his best plan for us, we, we got to realize it's not often right in front of our faces. When he's working upstream in our lives, he's asking simply follow me out of faith and obedience. Like, I think we've got this on the screen, but God wanted to show his people not just a good place to settle. He wanted to give them a preview of the very best he had to offer. I don't know about you, but when you see the floodwaters coming in life and all of a sudden you're like, why are those waters receding? Why are those waters going down? Maybe that's that moment where God's going, because I'm about to give you an opportunity to cross into something better. And a lot of times we're like, you know, I'm just going to settle over here because what if the water starts raging again when I get out there on dry land? What if it comes back at me? What happens then? And God's like, I just want you to walk across. I just want you to walk across. Surely the people would have kind of felt a deja vu experience in the nation of Israel. Like they had to have a moment where some of them are like, hey, I think we've done this before. Yet isn't it funny how God can do a miracle upstream at some other juncture in your life, and now you get over here and you forget about that miracle and there's some fear to go across. Or like I've already crossed one place where there was water and now it's dry. I'm not sure I can keep doing this. And God's like, just keep crossing. Just keep crossing. After they'd all safely crossed on dry ground, Joshua had a representative of each of the 12 tribes pick up a stone from the, from the middle of the Jordan where the ark of God was. He had them each pick one up. And, and these stones are set up as an altar um, that would be a sign of God's faithfulness to future generations. So they had a name for these. They called them Ebenezers. So I don't know if you grew up in church, but if you grew up in church and you ever sang the words, so we raise our Ebenezer, did you ever read, like sing that as a kid? And you're like, why are we singing about Scrooge? Like when I was a kid, I was like, who is Ebenezer? Why are we singing about this guy? I thought this was about Jesus. So we raise our Ebenezer. We raise, we raise an altar of remembrance. And they stack these stones so that future generations, when they, they walked by, they would see this and be like, this is where God did that thing. This is where God delivered. This was where God showed up. This was where God was who God said he was for our people. Then we read in Joshua 4.10. Now the priest who carried the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people. Just as Moses had directed Joshua. Now, I always laugh here because he sends word for them to get out of the water, but they didn't have Twitter or text messaging back then. That probably took a little while. Some guys just hanging out, just like, <laughs> just chilling in the water, upstream. The people hurried over, and as soon as all of them had crossed, the ark of the Lord and the priest came to the other side while the people watched. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over, ready for battle. Keep in mind, where do those three tribes have to, have to go back to? <laughs> they got to go back across at some point. They're just visitors now. They're, they're settled somewhere else. And they went over as they had been directed by Moses. About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. That day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they stood in awe of him all the days of his life, just as they stood in awe of Moses. Then the Lord said to Joshua, command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant law to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priest come up out of the Jordan. And the priest came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the, on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran the flood waters again. Just like that. Like, I, I don't know who the last guy out for Israel was, but I wonder if he did this and was like, whoa. How did you see that? Like, I, I think God did something. I think God performed a miracle. There could be no denying that God performed the miracle because as soon as Joshua commands the priest to come out of the water, boom, it starts back up. It, it happens again. And those three tribes that had settled... They were obedient by leading out. They're like, we'll go. 
Like, don't hear me. Like, God's not smiting them. They just, they just settled. They're not going to get this new land. They don't get the, the flowing milk and honey. They, they don't get the promise of the lush stuff that, that God has promised his people. They, they settled for something slightly less. Somewhere in their journey, they became settlers instead of pioneers. You, you, have to remember, you have to wonder what the members of these three tribes were thinking after seeing God perform the miracle. You ever think of stuff like that when you read scripture? Like, what were they thinking? Like, I'm sure there were some that must have second guessed. Man, why did I leave my wife and kids behind? Why didn't we take this journey? But why didn't we go into this together? You ever had those moments? Like where you feel like, man, life is kind of settled in. And then, then you, you go along with somebody on a little journey and they're like living this adventurous story with God. And you see God do some things in their lives. You ever come back from that and go, what are we doing? What have we settled for? Have we settled for mediocrity instead of the miracle? Have we settled for okay instead of God's best? When God longs to take us on a journey. I wonder what their thoughts were. Like, what about you? You ever second guessed a decision that you made and accepted something other than God's best for your life? You ever had that moment where you just knew this probably isn't the best, it's okay. But I've got something so much better. Like, I don't know about you, I don't ever wanna be content with settling for mediocrity. First of all, we don't serve a mediocre God. We serve a God of miracles. We serve a God who heals, a God who transforms, a God who restores, a God who does unimaginable things that we can't explain. You ever been there? And yet, so how quickly we forget sometimes what the miracles look like. Vince Lombardi, the great coach, the Green Bay Packers, one of the first two Super Bowls in history, he said this, he goes, if you'll not settle for anything less than your best, you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish in your lives. And while I think Vince had a good quote, I think I would edit it just a little bit. I think I would finish with, you'll be amazed at what God can accomplish in your life. Like if you just simply will understand that settling for anything less than the best of what God has for you, if you don't settle for anything less than the best, you'll be amazed at what God can accomplish through you. Like if you continue to say, you know what, I'm not going to settle. I'm going to keep pioneering in the kingdom because people's lives are at stake and we're going to take this land. Joshua knew they could take the land. The only way that they take the land is they got to get across that, that river. And the only way they get across the river is if God's miracle is there. And if God's miracle shows up, then they're going to settle in somewhere else and start pioneering even further than they did before without settling for less on the other side of the Jordan. Are you with me? And sometimes we settle for east of the Jordan instead of pushing west. And what if we didn't settle anymore? Jesus encountered this Canaanite woman who cried out for him in the New Testament to heal her demon-possessed daughter. I mean, she comes begging Jesus and, and Jesus didn't answer her word, uh, probably wanting to see how persistent she would be in her plea. But she keeps crying out to him so much to the point, she, she's so persistent that the disciples, like they have this moment, where, like they urge Jesus, hey Jesus, you gotta get rid of her, bro. Like she, she is starting to annoy the living daylights out of us. Like Jesus, make, just make her go away. And then Jesus says this really weird statement. I don't have time to unpack it today, but he goes, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, I don't have time to unpack the teaching this. We'll come back to this one day and study this text, okay? Here's what I would encourage you to do. Go home and study this text. Like become a student of Jesus and what, what he says. But I don't think he's doing this to demean this woman. But listen to the woman's response. She goes, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She's persistent. She could have easily went, you're right, and walked away. But she was persistent. She didn't settle for her daughter continuing to be harassed by Satan and his demons. Isn't it interesting when it's your kids, all of a sudden you get real persistent. My kid is sick. My wife's a nurse. She goes to the hospital and they're about to do nothing to help her. Watch her go into persistent mom mode. Like, pray to God you're not the person behind the window that's just asking her to fill out forms. She's coming. 
guns a blazing. She will sit in the office till you close. She's Italian. She'll wait in the parking lot for you. <laughs> it's amazing. Like This woman's like, I will not. I, I, you're the one. You're the one that everyone's told me can make this better, can make this go away. I will not settle for anything less than you saying you will heal my daughter. And Jesus looks at her and goes, woman, you've had great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter is healed at that moment. She was persistent. She didn't give up with Jesus. Like, what would happen if we all approached God with that kind of persistence? What, what would happen if, if, not just for ourselves, not just for our children, but for our neighbors, for those far from God, for those that we really don't want to know Jesus, but we know they need to know Jesus? Like, what if we were so persistent with the gospel of Jesus and we were so consistent with God that, that God, I'm going to hit my knees day after day after day, and I'm going to take every opportunity you give me to reach them with the gospel that I claim that I have. I'm just going to stick. God, will you answer that prayer? I promise you at some point he's going to answer it. I think I've shared this briefly with you before. My grandfather at like 86 years old was baptized. And there was a woman after he got baptized. There's a lot of jokes about my grandfather getting baptized. Like we literally thought the building would fall down. After service, she came up. If you've heard the story, you know, but she just said, hey, I just want you to know, I've prayed for Tommy to age for 40 years. 40. It wasn't 40 days. Like she wasn't reading a Rick Warren book and doing 40 days of purpose and praying for him. 40 years. I think my dad even joked with her something to the effect of, are you an Israelite wandering in the desert? Because that's what that had to feel like. And she got to see the promised land. She persisted. She never gave up. She took every opportunity to love on and care for my grandfather and my grandmother. And for 40 years, she prayed that the Grinch who stole Christmas would give his life to Jesus. That was my grandfather. And he did. And what if today you said, God, I'm not going to settle for anything less than your best in my own walk with you. For my kids, for my school, for my neighbors, for those I work with. By the way, that kind of intercession on behalf of other people yields huge answers from God. It changes people's lives. That's the kind of determination God's looking for from us. I'd go even further. For some of you today, are you content just to settle with an average journey of life? Or do you want God's best? Some of you have settled over here and you're like, I just don't think life changes from here. Maybe you, it's the divorce. Maybe it's the hard financial times you've fallen on. Maybe it's your kids, the broken relationship. I had a friend this week send me a message. He's been out of ministry for years. He said, do you think that a church would take a shot on a 55-year-old man who still has a passion for ministry that's been through a brutal divorce, is being painted in the worst of pictures by his ex? Do you think there's still room for me to make impact in the ministry? And my immediate response was, absolutely. Absolutely. Don't settle for what you've been. Settle for what God's calling you to be. Settle for the miracle that he's doing in your life, for the new wife that you have that's supportive, for the new wife that longs to see you live out the fullness of the gospel that God has called you to. Live that out. And it's not just for him, it's for you and it's for me. That we wouldn't settle. Like as a church, may we never settle for good enough. May we never settle for we've done enough. Until we take our last breath and every person within uh, earshot and eye shot and on camera and across the globe knows Jesus, we got some work to do. Would you agree? We got work to do. Why are we going to have a harvest party this year that we're going to just blow up everything out here? Literally, we're going to blow things up, I think, like blow up games and blow up this. And we're going to have food and car shows and all that. Why, why would we do stuff like that? Because there's a community that if we can get an opportunity to share Jesus with, we're going to take it. It means they walk on our campus because some guy sees a cool car in the parking lot. It's like, hey, honey, let's stop. So we'll do it. Why do we host cross-country meets on our property? 
Just a couple weeks ago, our guys told us there was thousands of people on our property on a Friday or Saturday, and there was runners out here everywhere. Uh, unbeknownst to me why people would run, I have no idea unless someone's chasing you, but they were out here running for fun. Um, thousands of people on our property, and you know why? You know why we do that? Because we want people to know Jesus, and if it gives them an opportunity to set foot on this place and find Jesus, we'll do it. Why do we offer an online campus? You know why? Because there's people sitting at home on Sunday morning that are gonna Google hope or church or transformation or life, and they're gonna land on this page. And some of you have done that today. And I want you to know there's hope for you. You're not alone. Why do we do all these things? Because we're not gonna settle for less. Can I just tell you, I, I will not settle until every single seat, every single room, every single place on this property is packed. And then every single living room, every single house, every single family is reached in the communities where people have house campuses right now. And as we continue to expand and just reach more people in the shortest amount of time, we will not settle. We will continue to pioneer for the gospel of Jesus. That's who we are. So I want you to do me a favor. I want to pray for us today. If you would just get on your feet, if you're in your living room or you're on vacation, you're in a hotel, um, you're, you're at work right now. I mean, it might be a little weird at work if you're standing there, but that's okay. Make your coworkers feel weird. Um, just everybody on your feet. Some of you today, the, the next step you need to pioneer is a relationship with Jesus. You need to stop settling for the things the world has to offer and take the miracle of Jesus. For some of you today, you've settled in your spiritual journey. You said, you know what? This is enough. I've done enough. It's, it's, not, it's, it's somebody else's turn. As long as you're breathing, you've got ministry life left in you. I don't care if you're four or you're 95. God wants to use you. Don't settle for less today. Say, God, I'm going to give everything I've got till the day I take my last. I'm going to be the miracle, not the mediocre. That we would live the miracle that God has called us to. If you have a decision today, you wanna to talk to somebody, you can come to our prayer room over here. If you're online, you can talk to somebody in the chat room. Uh, man, if you're new today, come to Starting Point. We've got a free gift for you, no strings attached. Um, we're not gonna sign you into something crazy. Uh, we just wanna meet you and give you a free gift today and share a little more hope with you. If you're online, uh, you can go to online Starting Point and talk to somebody there. Uh, they'll send you a little gift in the mail and take care of you as well. But let's pray together um, and then let's sing together as we get ready to be sent out today. God, thank you for today. Thank you for being a God that calls us to more than mediocre. God, that you call us out of mediocrity into the miracle that is Jesus. God, that you call us across from east to west, that, that you move the waters in life, God, that sometimes you work upstream and we, we can't see it. God, sometimes it's 40 years of prayer and persistence. God, for some of us, it's just the simple word of surrender. We're gonna surrender to you and not settle, but keep moving forward and pioneering for the gospel. God, if there's any here today that don't know you, God, lead them towards you, move them towards you, move them from mediocrity to miracle, God. Maybe it's a marriage that's living mediocrity right now. God, move it into miracle. God, maybe, maybe it's a relationship with kids today that's mediocre. God, move it into a miracle. God, maybe it's a situation at a job. God, maybe it's a move. Maybe, maybe it's just life. God, move it from mediocre to miracle. God, for some today, I know it's sickness. And they've just resigned themselves to this is it. God, move them from mediocre to miracle. And no matter how it, how it plays out in our lives, God, may we always look to pioneer for the kingdom. May we keep moving. God, we love you. It's your name we pray and all God's people said. Let's sing.